todo. It's good to be part of the bigger church of Jesus Christ, whether you're here in person, whether you're in Boyne or Petoskey, online. Um, I came from, before I moved to Petoskey two years ago, Tammy and I came from a church down in the Lansing area. We were there for 28 years, and I discovered that when we moved up here, we were called Flatlanders uh, down there. <laughs> and you know, it's actually pretty accurate, because it is pretty flat, uh, especially compared to up here. Uh, we traveled up north, though, different times. We uh, were very involved in a camp called Center Lake Bible Camp near Cadillac, Michigan, so we'd go up north pretty frequently up 127 was sort of our usual route up toward the Cadillac area. And um, I discovered that my first trip up there, I was getting, I think, just north of St. John's, and I noticed on the east side of the highway there, somebody had just started building a pole building. And it, was, it had been like a two-story pole building. I mean, these were tall poles in the shape of a building, um, just kind of ready. And I thought, wow, that's exciting. It's going to be a really neat building right there. Uh, we were up there for a little while, came back. No change, but you know it was only a few days, so that made sense. I was traveling back up the way about six months later, and I passed that spot again, and there was still nothing but these big poles in the air in the shape of the building. I thought, well, that's kind of odd. Um, I know the Bible has you know these lessons about you know count the cost and all that kind of stuff. You know, don't get started. Well, finally, I went by about 16 months later, and the same poles still in the air, nothing done. Six years later, same poles, still in the air, looking really weathered and slightly askew now, still there. 16 years later, same poles, same place, nothing finished. When we were starting to move up here two years ago, and I was traveling back and forth quite a bit, it sort of dawned on me, the poles were gone. And it actually like stunned me. Finally, somebody had had enough, there wasn't anything built, but they'd had enough with the unfinished building. And so I had, that was probably a good 20 years, at least, of that, that structure standing there. I don't know if they ran out of money, if they hadn't uh, you know, got too hard, or they had a disruption to their life, but it's kind of a sad thing when you see something unfinished. And if we're all really honest, we've got a bunch of unfinished projects at home, right? Uh, you know, in the basement or the garage, we, we've been there. What is more sad than an unfinished building, in my mind, is an unfinished life. None of us are really finished growing in Christ in this life, but hopefully we're making some progress along the way. So maybe I shouldn't use the word unfinished as much as a life not making progress. Uh, we are in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be in verse 24. We've already learned that the gospel is going out and it's bearing fruit and it's growing. Uh, it was Paul's prayer. We talked about unstoppable prayer a couple weeks ago that we would be always kind of growing, even in the difficult times, and we kind of challenged about how to pray differently for one another, for deeper things. Uh, I think Johnny came down and talked, and Tom, and they were talking a little bit more about who is Christ. And this is where it all starts. Um, that your faith is built on a firm foundation who is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But now Paul shifts gears in verse 24, and he starts talking a little bit about himself and what he does and has done and what God has called him to do in the church of Jesus Christ. And we're going to discover that this growing and bearing fruit is really built on the shoulders of other people. God has made a promise. Thank you, kids, for the verse about God keeping his promises, right? He doesn't lie. I caught that. God keeps his promises, and it says in the Bible that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So God continues to work in us. But God works in us through other people. I mean, you could probably think of some people who were key in your learning about Jesus or becoming more like a Christ follower. They were teachers or Sunday school teachers or grandmothers or just key people in your life. Paul was one of those key people. And if we're honest, our Christian growth is built on the blood, love, sweat, and tears of other people. So let's take a look at verse 24 of Colossians chapter 1. Paul starts saying some difficult things. I mean, up till now, it's been all exciting. You know, wow, Christ is this you know, uh, Lord over creation. He's the, the one above all. He's God in the flesh. But now he says, here's what it's been like for me serving the church of Jesus Christ. He says, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. There's lots of 
fullness language in this text, which is the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has, um, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. See, that's his goal, not, you know, a few poles in the air, not a sort of Christian, not a, I made a commitment and I grew a little bit when I went to Sunday school, but never since. Present everyone fully mature in Christ, and to this end I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Did you catch any language in that text? I mean, it wasn't all happy, happy, happy. He's basically saying he's working his butt off doing the work of the ministry because he sees it as an important ministry to bring people to fullness in Jesus Christ. Or as I'm titling this message, the demanding delight of bringing people to completion in Christ. It's a dangerous, demanding, and yet delightful thing to disciple other people. And it's not just Paul. The Bible says that we're all called to be ministers. Sometimes people use the word minister to describe my job. But that's, we're all ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We all carry it out in the world. We help point people to Jesus, and we proclaim him. So my challenge to you this morning is I'm, I'm going to be really honest with you. I'm going to challenge you to get more engaged in Christian ministry, whether that ministry is an official position in a church like Kathy kind of challenged us to get involved in children's ministry, uh, whether it's being more active when you're at, at your workplace or at your school, telling your coworkers or friends about what it means to be a Christ follower, but to just not be some poles in the air that got started once and have made no difference ever since. I also want to sympathize with you because it's not easy, and I want to encourage you because Christian ministry is hard work, but it's worth it. It is hard work, but it is worth it. So I'm going to make four observations about the demanding delight of bringing people to completion in Jesus Christ. The first is this. Again, just being really honest with you, your ministry is a painful calling. It's a painful calling. I just came from a conference uh, in Orlando, Florida. I was down there for a couple of days with some other uh, folks from the Petoskey Church, and we didn't have any sunshine. I came home Friday and had more sunshine in the first hour I landed in Michigan than I did all of my time in Florida. Is that just backwards? It is so backwards. I went to the Sunshine State, no sun. Anyway, uh, we had this worship time there. It was about 800 people in the auditorium. They had this band that was playing that was skill-wise phenomenal. I didn't like it. They were, um, it was, they were too much of a show for me. I mean, it was, you know, lights and smoke. And, and the thing was right out of the gate, they just always, we're so excited to be here, and are you excited to be here? And, you know, it's a convention-y, conference-y thing. You pump everybody up. I get that. But every day, every session, it was that same thing. I just thank you, Bob, for singing today. I really like the acoustics of this room. I couldn't hear even myself sing in that other place, but I could hear all of you sing here, and it's, it's beautiful. And it's not about simple music, lifting my heart to God. Where I'm going with this is, I think if you were new to Christianity and you went to that, you'd leave with the sense that everything should always be exciting and wonderful and good and pleasant and smooth and easy. And then Paul comes to this text and he says, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. Paul says, I'm suffering for the gospel. But I'm okay with that. Not only okay with that, I'm actually, in some strange way that we'll talk about, rejoicing in that. Because he says that in my suffering for you, and where is he writing this? Does anybody remember where Colossians is written from? He's in jail. He's writing to Colossae, but he's in jail, probably in Rome. So when he says, I'm suffering, you know, he's not just having a cloudy day. Uh, he's in jail. But he says that I'm doing this suffering, I see it as part of my ministry because I'm filling up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's suffering. I gotta tell you, the first time I read that, that almost sounds like heresy, like something's lacking in what Jesus did on the cross, because I was taught that Christ said it is finished and his work is sufficient and there's nothing to be added. And Paul says, 
I have work to do because something's lacking. So I mean, that little bells and whistles go off in my head, kind of going, warning, you know, what, what is this that Paul's saying? What Christ did for us, the work of justification, the work of being a substitutionary atonement, dying once for all, is only something Christ could do. That's who we learned about in the verses just before this. Um, but it doesn't mean that the work is finished yet. So he redeemed me, he bought me, he rescued me from the kingdom of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of his dear son. That's only what Christ could do. But there's more work still to do. So it's kind of like, um, man is a realtor, right? So it's sort of like if you buy some property, you got to pay the price. And then you get the title. It takes a long time to pay it off, but let's just pretend you have all the money and you paid it all off at once. And all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's done. The transaction is done. But there's still no building. And it's, there's blueprints. There's effort that needs to be done. And it's as if Christ you know, brings us into the family of God and he purchased us with the blood of Jesus Christ. He owns the title to our lives. We are his. And now there's work to be done. And it is God doing the work, but the work is being done through people swinging hammers. The work is being done through people like you who are ministering to kids like this, who are encouraging one another through prayer, who are just testifying to what Christ is doing in your life, who are encouraging somebody to read the Bible, or visiting somebody who is sick, or bringing them a meal. That's the building, and that's done by Christ through us. So Paul's writing. He's under house arrest, and he's saying, just as Christ suffered, I also need to suffer. And it's interesting, when Paul first became a believer, you know, he had been persecuting Christians, God grabbed him, and became a Christian, and then in his early conversion, he sent this man named Ananias to go talk to him. And Ananias is like, I'm not going to go talk to this guy. He was killing people like me. And Jesus said, you go talk to him because I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name. Like he's got this unique call that it's going to be a hard road for Paul because he made it hard on a lot of Christians. And God's not doing that just to like spank him. God's doing it saying, I'm going to give you the hard work. You're going to, go to the, you're going to the far reaches. You're going to the difficult people. And was that true of Paul? Listen to, what, listen to what Paul physically experienced. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, five times, now as a believer, sharing the gospel, suffering to fill up in his flesh. He says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That means he got whipped 39 times, just one short of what Romans considered deathly. Five times that happened to him. I'm going to do the math on that, but that's a lot. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. That just freaks me out. Floating on a piece of wood for a night and a day. In the dark, far from land. Sharks. I don't know if there's sharks in the Mediterranean, but still freaking me out. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen. In danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city and in the country, at sea, in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled. I've gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. These are all the physical, actual sufferings that being a Christ follower, Jesus experienced, or Paul experienced. And then here's the one that gets me as a pastor, because this one I, I, I can't identify, to be honest with you, with most of that. Losing sleep over ministry, that one I got. Verse 28, besides everything else, as it's like, here's the capstone, here's the big one. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. I mean, there's all that physical stuff, but my heartache for whether people are growing in Christ and churches are prospering and knowing Christ, that's the biggest weight of them all. That's the burden. So that's Paul's suffering. What about us? If any of you have been involved at all in the church for a while, you've been serving, you've been helping, you've been leading, how many of you have ever found it a pain in the neck? Come on, get your hands up in the air. You didn't want to do it. You didn't want to go and serve. You were tired of it. I mean, I tell people there's a lot of mornings I wake up and I don't want to go to church and I'm the pastor. But I'll tell you then once I go, I'm so glad I went. But there are times where I'm going, you know, I don't want to do this. And it's difficult because dealing with people's lives is a messy business because people's lives are messy. I remember a number of years ago, Tammy and I were just getting started in ministry. I was actually an interim pastor at a church as I was just getting started in pastoral ministry. And we had this young couple kind of come to the church. Um, she was very pregnant. 
they had a really rough life. They were looking for help. And, and so our church just rallied around them. And we shared the gospel with them. They made professions of faith. We helped them get in this apartment. They didn't have enough money, but they started getting a job. And so we were kind of coming alongside and subsidizing it. A bunch of people donated furniture. They donated these dishes that I remember my wife thought were cool dishes. I think if I remember right, she wished she had them, but no, that's right. We'll donate them, you know, and uh, to the couple and all that kind of stuff. They had their ups. They had their downs. She was, went into labor, and I don't know, we couldn't find him. So I'm, I took her to the hospital that night to deliver her child like in the middle of the night, thinking, please don't ask me to go into the delivery room because I'm not going. Um, you know, but the uh, baby was born, all was good. That went for, you know, months. And all of a sudden, I got a call from the landlord of the apartment. And he said, uh, Tim and Shirley vanished. I mean, like, they just up and left. And they left their apartment a mess. And we'd been working with this landlord, so he knew us. He said, I can't. Somebody needs to come deal with their stuff. So Tammy and I were the first ones there. We said, well, let's go see what it is and what we can do. And we walked into what we affectionately called the den of iniquity. It was a mess. And it was full of stuff that I don't want to go into. Um, and we had to clean it all up. Um, and I'm not sure what happened to Tim and Shirley, to be honest with you, after that. I, I hope that the seeds we planted and the love that we showed them bore fruit at some point. But frankly, dealing with messy lives is messy. Now, for every one of those difficult stories, I could also tell you people who have been bearing fruit for Jesus Christ. Lighting up lives in the world because they have been continuing to walk with Jesus. And I'll touch on some of that toward the end, but... I just want to be honest with you. This is my first. It's painful sometimes to be serving in the body of Christ. Emotionally difficult. Physically, you don't want to get up and go to church in the morning. Um, you're, you're tired of the complaints. You wonder if what you said or did made any difference or not. And perhaps you're tired or burned out. Um, this afternoon, I'm looking forward to watching a little bit of football. We're getting down to the end here in the NFL, and that's awesome games last weekend. Uh, Tammy, I've got a wonderful wife who, who will sit next to me while I watch football. She usually reads or something like that, but if it's a good game, she'll get into the game. Last Sunday, she was into the game. She was louder than anybody else. I think she got a sore throat because uh, they were good games. In football, people come out of the game once in a while. Why? Yeah. They get rest. They need rest, right? They've been playing. They play after play after play. They need a breather. So they need to step away for a bit. Somebody said they get hurt. Yeah, sometimes they get injured and you gotta come out of the game for a while. Sometimes, this one's less common and you don't always see it, sometimes the coach pulls them out for discipline. They didn't play well, or a lot of times if they do get what's called a personal foul, I mean like almost automatic, you're out for a play at least. Like, think about it. And they come out for that. We as Christian ministers, that's all of us, sometimes step out of the game. Sometimes we need to for some rest. Let's be honest, we're just kind of, we've been running hard and we need a break here. Sometimes we get injured. People say things to us or do things to us and until we sort that out, it's hard to minister to other people. Sometimes God sets us to the side for some discipline because we're not really walking with him, we're walking in sin and we need to kind of get it straight before we get back in the game. But here's the point I want you to get across. In football, for all those people, they may be out of the game, but what's the end goal? Get back in the game. You're rested, get back in the game. You're injured, get healed, get back in the game. You are disciplined, make the correction, get back in the game. And so I want to just challenge you. I know some of you in this room, it has been hard, or it currently is hard. Maybe you need to take a rest, but it's only a temporary rest. Maybe you've been injured, don't just lick your wounds. Talk to somebody, come see a pastor. Find some healing for those wounds. If God has disciplined you, turn your life around, but in all of this, Get back in the game. Don't sit on the sidelines. That is not what you were made for. So we are also called to suffer for Jesus. Let me, let me just say that. Now, we might be thinking, well, Paul said that. You know, I'm supposed to suffer because, you know, he persecuted Christians. That's a unique calling of Paul to suffer. And I think he did have a pretty unique calling in a certain way. But listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 9. Jesus suffered. Paul suffered. He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. That's the ministry of Christ. 
Then he said to them all, if anyone, that's a pretty big word, compass the apostles, the early believers, probably the church in Boyne City in 2022, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, tries to hold on to it, will lose it. Whoever loses it, is willing to suffer, willing to give it away, willing to serve, will save his life. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So your ministry is hard work. It will take an emotional toll. It will take a physical toll, and no one said it would ever be otherwise. So if somebody's saying, come to Jesus, and it'll all be great, and it'll all be easy, keep serving Jesus, and it'll be a delight every day, they're lying to you. Just telling you, this is what it is in Scripture. So if you're a little tired of leading because it doesn't seem like anyone's following, you're tired of teaching, it doesn't seem like anyone's listening, you're praying and you're wondering if the results are really there, maybe you're part of something that cleans up around people or a church that's part of your ministry, it keeps getting messed up, you're calling around with kids on the floor, it doesn't seem like anybody appreciates it, welcome to ministry. Now there's good stuff coming, hang in there, I don't want to discourage you too much. I just want to say thank you for those of you who keep at it. My guess is somebody kept at it in your life, and that's why you're sitting here today as well. So praise God for them, and I praise God for you. It's a demanding delight. So what keeps you going? So here's the good news. Let's, let's move to the good news. Your ministry, even though it is a painful calling, your ministry is also a conduit. Kathy put up a pipe up here. It's that same kind of thing. It's something in which something flows. It is a conduit of Christ's power. When you present yourself to God to serve, his power, his grace flows through you. Let's keep looking at our text here. Colossians 1.28 says, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that when we present everyone fully mature in Christ, we want that building to be getting finished, and he says, to this end, I strenuously contend. Sounds like he's doing a lot of work, doesn't it? But he's not alone. I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I'm working hard because he's working hard in me. I'm serving because he's giving me the energy to do so. Our labor, our struggle is matched with the power of Jesus Christ. When you share in his suffering, you share in his power. We, don't want, we want to share in his power, we don't want to share in the suffering. The suffering, in some ways, is the conduit. It's that when you empty yourself and you open yourself, that's where his power is willing to flow through you. If you're full of yourself and full of, you know, I want it to be comfortable and easy, there's no power guarantee here from God. He'll let us try it in our own strength. I remember my previous church starting a ministry we called Faith Garage, uh, and it was started out mainly trying to fix cars. There was a bunch of guys that said, you know, there's people in our church and in our community that that can't afford it, that don't have the skills. We got a bunch of guys that are really good at it. Let's, let's, let's do this. And uh, the guy who was leading, it was a big vision guy, not big on details. And he kind of, he got the group together and he started pouring on like, we could do this and we could do this. And everyone started to freak out. And I remember people going, we're already, you know, we're already scared. What are you doing? And I was a little like, this is getting a little crazy. But then I kind of just thought about it. It's like, that's when I'm walking in God's territory, when I have to rely on his power. See, I, I tend a little bit more to go, measure it, what can I do, let's do that. But God's like, let's go bigger than what you can do, let's do what my power can do. So, how are you connected to the power source? You connect through prayer, through the Word of God, through teamwork, be part of the team. That's where you draw upon the strength of God to continue to do the work of Jesus Christ. So our ministry is a painful calling. It's a conduit of power, though, when we're willing to enter into the suffering of Christ. His power will flow to us. And then here's just another straight-up warning. Your ministry is in conflict with other purposes. In other words, expect some resistance along the way. It's in conflict. What you're trying to do for Jesus will be opposed. So if sometimes you feel like it's a struggle, it's because there's opposition. If sometimes it things like what you build, someone else seems to tear down, it's because there's opposition. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. We are completers. We're trying to bring people to fullness in Jesus Christ. That's our job. Bring them to completion. Christ working through us. And then our adversary is called the destroyer. He's trying to destroy what it is we're trying to build and complete. And he uses other people as well. People who come along and criticize. People who get us off the path by false teaching. Um, so listen to a few things. I'm just going to throw some verses out. They're a little further down in chapter 2 that we'll encounter later. But 
Paul says, um, well, first of all, verse 4, we kind of hit on that. He says, I tell you all this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. In other words, he's saying, I'm telling you it's hard work, and don't let anybody deceive you. There's deceivers out there. Warning, deceivers. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. There are people out there trying to take your mind captive. You're opposed. Verse 16, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, new moon celebration, or Sabbath day. There's people out there trying to judge you, condemn you, and bring you down. Chapter 2, verse 18. Don't let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. There's people trying to disqualify you. It's a battle. I remember there's a movie that came out called Lincoln. This is a number of years ago. A great movie on the Civil War. And it starts with this opening scene of violent hand-to-hand -hand combat in the Civil War. And it, it just like shocks you right away. And I found that necessary because I read about the Civil War in a textbook. And I, I know what happened. I've been to Gettysburg three different times. I get it at some level. But it all seems long ago. When they start with that kind of action, I'm like, it's a battle. I think sometimes we read this book and we go, well, that's the stuff Paul did long ago. And we forget it's a battle now. And we need that, that kind of slap up alongside that this is not opposed, what we're trying to do for Christ. All right, so it's sounding pretty grueling by now. Right? It's painful. Uh, fortunately, there's some power flowing to us, but yet we've got opposition, we've got opponents. Here's what I want to finish with. Your ministry is a rewarding cause. I told you it was painful, but I also want to tell you it's a pain that is worth it. And just about anything in life that is worth it creates, causes, needs some kind of work, right? Causes some difficulty before we get to the prize. It's what I call a painful joy. I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, is how Paul began. A painful joy. The closest I can come to this is childbirth. Now, I, I hate doing childbirth illustrations because all the women are looking at me and go, what do you know? And to be honest, I don't. I mean, I was there, so I have some sense. Uh, we have three kids, but okay. Um, a painful joy. Most moms would agree with me that that's exactly what childbirth is. It is a painful, difficult horrible process that's worth it, right? That there's joy in it. And that's what we're doing when we're bringing birth to, to people in Christ and growing them up in Christ. Here's the interesting thing is that the birth pains kind of come back sometimes. I mean, they don't in human birth, fortunately. Uh, and yet, I'm going to tell you, most of you parents who have been parents for a while will probably agree with me that that pain of childbirth, as difficult as that was, those of you who have raised kids all the way through, know that the pain of raising kids sometimes overshadows the pain of the giving birth. When they start sassing you back in those preteen years, you're going, painful, what is this? When you get anxious about a medical condition because of what the doctor said, or they're crying at night to you because they feel like all their friends hate them, and have abandoned them. And all of a sudden you're going, it's painful not just to give birth, but it's painful to raise them. And, and, and even when they're grown and they have their own kids, there's pain involved. They wander from God. They make the dumbest, most stupid, painful decisions, and, you, and it hurts your soul. Yeah. It's a painful joy. It's part of the process, not just of giving birth, but of raising them. The Apostle Paul knew it, and Galatians was a church that was really kind of starting to fall away in terms of their understanding of grace. And he says this in 419, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. He has repetitive childbirth pains as Christ is being formed in them. Welcome to ministry. It's like giving birth again and then again. And I've experienced that as a pastor. We make growth. Or I, I disciple somebody. We're moving along as the Tim and Shirley's of the world. And then they just kind of like go way off the deep end for a while. And you're going, I, uh, not this again. We already did this childbirth thing with you. And we're doing it again. Yep. Welcome to ministry. But the delights are amazing. Yes, we can look forward to say there's great rewards. Kathy testified, was it Mrs. K you said in her name? Mrs. K? Mrs. K, is she still with us or is she gone to glory? I'm sure she's gone. Some, Mrs. K stood before Jesus Christ and he said to her, well done, good and faithful servant. If that's not a joy that makes it worth it, I don't know what is. 
And it's not just in the future. It's joys that we experience now. Verse 5 of Colossians 2. It says, For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm you are in the faith. I'm watching you grow, and I'm so excited, and it's worth me being in jail for, is what Paul says. In 3 John, he says, It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth, how you continue to walk in him. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. It's hard work. I've suffered. I've been shipwrecked. But when I hear that there's progress, I am so psyched. And it's all worth it. Uh, my wife and I have some good friends. This would definitely be what I would call my wife's best friend. We walked with them through years. They have three dog, grown daughters now. Um, we, we were pastor of them when they were young. And they had a rough go after a while. Their oldest one, um, she got pregnant before she got married, ended up you know, kind of getting married in that you know, but at the time, it was a painful thing as a parent to have to work through that with their kid. Their next daughter, beautiful young woman, got hooked on heroin. In and out of jail, got pregnant, couldn't, have, couldn't keep the baby. I mean, she, they, she ends up with the baby, but different. we had the baby at our house different times because she wasn't allowed to have her. Mom called me one day. I went over from the church office to their house. She was sort of trying to detox. And mom couldn't handle her. She needed help. I'm going to tell you, I couldn't handle her. I heard, I was called every name in the book by her because we wouldn't let her leave because she needed to go get some stuff. And she wanted us to get some stuff. And she hated her mom and she hated her parents and she hated me and she hated God and she hated the church. And I thought she was going to be violent. I had to get between her and her mom a couple of times. Whew. Today, both of those young women and their third one are godly young women serving Jesus Christ in the church. And it was hard. Hard for the parents. Hard for me, who's just trying to help along the way. I'm so excited. Man, I'm excited. And when I see marriages restored because a husband puts away his anger or his pride and a woman her bitterness and they come together, and I've seen that, I go, it's worth it, God. And I go through days where I want to quit the ministry. I used to walk home sometimes. I, I lived close enough to the church, and I'd walk home. and I, don't, I wasn't even feeling that down, but I would just suddenly catch myself going, I quit. I mean, like out loud, I would just walk along and go, I quit. And then I'd take about five more steps and go, okay, well, not really. <laughs> but I feel like quitting because it's hard. But then I see parents get reconciled with their children, and I go, I, could, I, you know, I can live on that for another six months. When I see somebody go, Pastor, you, you shared this in your message, and it made me think this differently, and here's how I've been living differently. I'm good for another year. When I see a kid come up here and share their verses, and they understand what it means, keep me going for another six months, because Christ is making a difference. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Not because he's sadistic, because that's the path of transformation, both for us, the servers, and the people that we're serving. So how do we put this into practice? Let's wrap up with some next step. I want to just encourage you, first of all, engage in ministry. Take up the demanding delight of discipleship. Get involved. You may have checked out because you're getting older and you figure that was, you know, it's for the young people now. No. Get involved in praying. Get involved in greeting. Welcome people at the door. Make sure you talk to the person sitting next to you. You're making a difference for Jesus Christ. Engage in ministry. Maybe you're the next step. Be restored for ministry. Maybe you've been hurt, or you're exhausted, or you've failed. Do whatever it takes to get back in the game. Don't just sit there and wait for something magical to happen. Get spiritual rest. Seek help for that. Get spiritual healing. Seek help for that. Get back in the game. Get back in the game because it's worth it. Re-engage in ministry. That's the last step. Be restored. Take the steps. Third thing, re-engage. Get back in the game. Um, I can't remember how we're supposed to end. I got too excited. Uh, I'm praying. I'm going to pray, I think, here in a second. And then whoever's going to do whatever's next, is going. Daryl's going to come up. Would you stand up with me? I want to just, just pray. <laughs> Lord.
Lord God, I just want to thank you for the Church of Jesus Christ. Let me start broadly. I want to thank you for the Mrs. K's. I want to thank you for my grandmothers and my grandfathers who set an example for me. I want to thank you for youth group leaders or teachers. I want to thank you for those neighbors, those Sunday school teachers, those people who built into our lives, and that's why we're here today, because they were willing to sacrifice and serve, and I'm sure we'd never think about it, but it, was, it wasn't easy for them. They gave up time. They gave up money. They... And here we are today. Praise God. Lord, I thank you for Genesis Church. I thank you for these people here in Boyne City, and I know some of them are probably a little exhausted or tired. Maybe they've been hurt. Lord, I pray for their healing, and I pray for hope, and I pray for that when the time is right, that they will be fully engaged and in the game, not because it's easy, but because it's worth it. I thank you, God, for these people who have been serving and some who have even been suffering, and I thank you that that's the path of Jesus that you call us to. And thank you that there's no higher calling or greater joy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.